this is such a beautiful country. Um, but anyway, I suppose we should talk about things. Um, so this is me. And actually, um, before this conference, it was like for the marketing materials, I needed like, you know, a picture of me like looking all professional and stuff. Um, so I sent this one. I don't know if you can see it very well, but basically I'm like, so it's kind of like become like a meme of sending like weirder and weirder pictures. Um, but anyway, here's some contact info for me. Again, I have cards that you'll be able to get um, if you want to talk to me um, about, you know, anything, life, security, you know, whatnot. Um, also, I wanted to share this with you because it's awesome. So I went to the like Chitwood National Park um, this week, and this is a rhinoceros that's like, or I guess you guys call it a gaida, and it's just walking down the road, like just, and then it walks up to this like street vendor, and it's like, give me a beer and chips, bitch, <laughs> and I felt like that was like the perfect like metaphor for security, and I should use it in all my presentations forever, uh, because. Really, you can put like all the security in place possible, but when like a rhino walks up and says like, I'm gonna take your popcorn, none of your security stuff is gonna be able to do anything about it. In fact, the street vendor, like one of the street vendors like was real he-man about it, but his wife like took off. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, the wife was the security person and probably the smarter one, let's be honest. We're talking about a rhinoceros here. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, I typically talk about mobile security, um, and you know, I used to be, well, I still am to an extent, like, you know, zero day, rah, 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 hacker. Um, but I've also, I guess, kind of grown up in a way and realized that while like zero day is, is really cool and all, uh, like in terms of actually like helping customers and everybody from small businesses to individuals to large enterprises to governments, you know, actually secure their stuff in a reasonable way. Um, you know, dealing with, you know, zero days isn't necessarily like the biggest threat for anybody. You know, for a lot of people, they're unlikely to get hit at all by zero day. They just, you know, don't have that kind of profile that they're gonna become after a, a nation state. Um, but even if, if they are, um, it, why would they bother burning a zero day if something like, for instance, phishing or a missing patch or a default password would work just as well? Um, so I guess what I'm actually saying is what I'm gonna talk about is actually not that sexy, but it's incredibly effective. Um, so this is kind of like what most of my customers think their networks are like. I, you know, if you see the blue boxes, you probably maybe have seen something like this before. Um, I probably stole it from Cisco at some point because they do blue boxes. Um, but the main point being that, well, I mean, obviously it's a slide, so it's flat, right? But um, the idea being that, one, that, you know, everything's flat and, you know, we control everything as IT and security. You know, everything on our network, we built it, we control it in terms of like what updates it has, what its security profile is, what we allow users to do on it, and where the traffic is going you know, in and out of our network. We control all that and that's awesome. And not so much. I don't know if that was ever the case, but it's certainly not the case now. I mean, our, our reality now is so very far away from this that you know, we don't really, I like to say the perimeter has been shattered because the worst part about it is that we don't control like anything going in and out of our network anymore really because there's all these other ways it can go in and out. You know, all our I IoT devices and mobile devices and even some of our laptops now have got mobile modems in it. Like this is the way we're going. Um, we've got people who work from home, they work from coffee shops, they're, you know, getting on uh, potentially hostile networks, they're hooking up their phones to rental cars, um, you know, they're going abroad, um, you know. I know my country, you know, back in the U.S., we are, uh, you know, mobile infrastructure, for instance, definitely attacks devices. There's certainly other countries that do as well. I don't know if you guys do, but some of your neighbors might. Um, but we certainly do in the U.S. Um, you know, our infrastructure, you know, there's nothing you can do about it as a user. Like, it just spies on you by default. So, you know, your devices are going to scary places. The mobile threat model, I like to think of, 
Well, one, I think of like mobility, internet of things, cloud, and you know, all these like new things like vapor and whatever they want to call them. You know, they're really kind of the same thing. You know, they're things that we as IT don't control, we as security don't control. Like, you know, the cloud is really the same thing as somebody's mobile device to me. Somebody brings their mobile device um, onto my network. You know, again, they're the administrator of it. I don't have a lot of insight into it. Um, I use somebody's cloud service. It's, you know, I know it's a cloud in the picture, but it's really just somebody's servers somewhere. Um, and I don't have any control over whether, you know, they're updating their servers, how they're storing passwords in their database. You know, I just kind of have to assume that they're doing a good job if I'm going to use their cloud services. So the threat model, I think, is really similar for, I guess, all of these things that you would consider next generation. They're really just you know, taking all the control out of our hands as security people, which, uh, let's face it, kind of sucks. Um, but um, they have a very similar threat model to everything we've dealt with so far. You know, they have the potential for remote code execution, you know, no hands from the user. They just have to, you know, send something to like the mobile modem or the Wi-Fi chip or the Bluetooth chip, and and the magic happens and the attackers take over. Luckily, that doesn't happen that often. Uh, there's also client-side attacks. You know, somebody opens something, a uh, document in the PDF viewer, an email, a picture, you know, a web page, and you know that triggers a vulnerability. And certainly, that has a social engineering component of you know, getting people to go to the malicious files. Um, what we really have a lot of, though, is different ways that people can be targeted. Like on your traditional machine, like if you had a laptop that was running Windows, yeah, and it was on the local network, you'd probably you know, go after some open ports on the thing. You know, 445 is a good one um, for your uh, server message block, which should be like server like message exploitable, but nobody asked me. Uh, but then, you know, on these mobile and IoT devices, we have like, I mentioned a couple, um, like Bluetooth and, and whatnot. I think there's actually a slide on uh, input and output, but there, the point being there's like tons of ways these things talk. And, you know, we've, we've been kind of pretty good at sort of like doing a good job of, you know, things like intrusion detection and, and egress filtering and next gen firewall. and and data loss prevention um, through like, you know, just regular like wired and wireless connection going in and out of our network at the perimeter. Um, but when you start bringing in things like mobile modems and Bluetooth and near field communication and, you know, again, there's a slide with like a list. Um, none of those go through that perimeter and all of that stuff that we put at the perimeter that we spend all that money on, all gone. Didn't stop it at all. So, you know, it's, again, kind of made us go back to the basics. What I actually find kind of funny about a lot of this stuff, and again, you have to think of mobility as like cloud, mobility, IoT. You know, everything that we're doing now is that, you know, we actually built them with security in mind, which, you know, that, that's what our last two speakers told us we were supposed to do, right? Build our products with security in mind. But it kind of bit us in the foot um, in this particular case because, the assumption was that you know everything we built before that it was like when we built like the personal computer the idea security was very much an afterthought um, so all the security stuff we kind of built on top of it same thing with like TCP/IP it was like oh now we need firewalls and things um, but when we actually started building these next gen devices we thought oh well we should build them with security in mind so this caused a bit of a problem um, I like to use the example of antivirus right. Um, so antivirus gets a really bad rap. Everybody hates antivirus. But antivirus does a really good job at one particular thing, and that is protecting people like my mother. <laughs> she has a PhD in computer science. This is not a my mom can't use computers story at all. Um, she's actually quite good at it, but she loves her some online games. Never did she meet like an online game download she didn't just love. And a lot of those, let's be honest, come with a little extra features. And a lot of them, you know, they're not APT by any means. So, you know, her antivirus, you know, it, name any one of them that people use, it pops those and says this is bad and helps her clean it up. And we put it on there and all it can do, because it can't see the other applications, is scan itself to see whether it's a virus.
And certainly there is the possibility of malicious applications in the mobile world, but all the work that we'd done in antivirus was now functionally useless just because you know, the mobile device was just a little bit too secure for that to work. And so, yeah, I mentioned there's you know, mobile input, output. You know, we've got cellular, uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, the SIM card, you know, those run Java. Um, the power cord, certainly, uh, you know, malicious power cords were a really big thing at DEF CON this year, though they have been for years, so I guess the media disliked it this year. Near field communication, I mean, the main point being that we have all these other ways these things communicate, um, and that just makes it that much scarier, because again, all the security that we built is now not going to work, because if it's sitting, like, at the perimeter TCP IP of your um, your uh, network and the attack is going in and out via the mobile modem, you're not going to have any of that egress or data loss prevention or whatnot. And of course it gets even scarier because when you bring in a device, it, you don't just have the device, you have all of the services that come along with it. So you've also got um, like the back end for your carrier as well as the device itself. So anytime it's pushing updates to the device, it has an app store, um, any of that stuff in the background, uh, those are all, again, just cloud servers somewhere. And if somebody on the end of like the, uh, the service provider forgot to update or used a crappy password or you know, put their, uh, or their keys up on GitHub or something by mistake, you know, an attacker can just get in there and, again, there's nothing we as the user can do. We haven't done anything wrong if the actual server that our device is supposed to respond to uh, for updates has been compromised. Um, so, you know, they're actually sending legitimate updates from the right place that are signed by the right people. It just so happens somebody else got in there. Um, so, you know, that makes it even scarier because it's, it's like we don't just have to deal with one device and one user. We have to deal with you know, all the back-end stuff that comes with it that, again, we don't control. Which brings us to social engineering. You know, I mentioned that, you know, this profile stuff that I'm about to talk about is really not that sexy. Um, and it's not that sexy for the, the very simple reason that the user has to click yes. And, uh, you know, real hackers, you know, it's got to be like remote code execution. Social engineering is so not cool. But, you know, in the real world, let's be honest, I mean, we take, like, some of the the coolest attacks there are, like, uh, for instance, like the Trident attack, which was not one, not two, but three zero days against iOS. And it all started with a text message. In order for them to get, like, the first hit against the browser, so basically they hit the browser, they moved out of the browser, like, to user space, they moved to user space, um, to root um, on the iOS device, so it took three different iOS exploits, which is, you know, millions of dollars worth of exploits, but in order to start this chain, they had to get somebody to click on a, a link in a text message. So in the real world, even when we're being like really sophisticated, there's usually some sort of social engineering component. And you know, let's be honest, we haven't really fixed the let's not click on links in emails thing yet. That works a lot of the time. So bringing in these mobile devices where they have all these different ways they can communicate um, that just makes it that much worse. You know, I mentioned text messaging. Um, we certainly have uh, things like QR codes. You know, a lot of people just, just scan them and, you know, they go where they go. Um, and, uh, you know, things like WhatsApp where they say they're secure. I think that gives people, like, this false sense of security that if, like, they get a link in WhatsApp while it's secure, it's not that big a deal. But still, if they click on it, it opens in their browser, so, you know, it kind of <laughs> defeats the purpose there. It's still going to you know, work out the same way. Basically, anyway, all of these uh, social medias, any way that anybody can be sent a link, um, that is, you know, a way they can potentially be targeted for social engineering. So even people who are pretty savvy about, you know, not clicking on the links in the emails, you know, they might find themselves undermined a little bit um, when it comes to some of these other ways they might be targeted. Um, so certainly, oh, well, I just hit the wrong button. All right. So I mean, certainly there, I think at this point, people believe me that there is an impact to having like mobile and IoT and whatnot compromised in your enterprise. For a long time, it was like, well, who cares? Like if you hit my, uh, 
my IoT coffee pot, it's not like I store corporate information or like my PII or personally identifiable information on my IoT coffee pot. Who cares if it gets exploited? But if the IoT coffee pot is you know, connected to the local network you know, at work, in your office, and it's on the same network as you know, your, your laptops and your servers, and let's face it, nobody has been able to come up with a, a way to completely secure the internal network. Let's be honest here, nobody's pulled it off. So you know, you've got that one box that somebody forgot about that's under the floor that's still went running Windows 2000, and the coffee pot that's been exploited is able to jump from the coffee pot to that, which has you know, the same domain admin credentials on it as the new domain admin box, um, and then that's able to get you, you know, access to everybody's laptops, everybody's servers, database, you know, whatever it is that you, you're trying to keep secure there, and it all started with a coffee pot. So, I mean, certainly there are problems to anything that is compromisable hanging around. Um, so that's an example of pivoting, which is my favorite, you know, getting on one thing and using it to jump to somewhere else. Um, and you know, certainly we can steal data off devices. We can remotely control devices, like if, I, if I'm on somebody's phone, like I can post to Twitter for them potentially. I can record video or audio of them. I don't know about you, but I'd take the thing in the bathtub. Um, a lot of business executives um, who are like in closed door meetings, um, if, if they're being recorded you know, and it gets into the wrong hands per se, um, you know, it, it might be bad. Um, so naturally, you know, we built some stuff to try to solve this problem. Obviously, like the mobile device uh, antivirus that just scanned itself was obviously not enough. Um, so we had to build some other things. Um, so the, you know, first we built basically mobile device management. Um, it took the place of the BlackBerry Bez or BlackBerry Enterprise Server. Um, something I've learned a lot about in business is if there's a line item in people's budgets for it, it's a really good place to like put your product. Um, so when people were moving from iPhones or moving from Blackberries to iPhones and Androids, they had a line item for a Blackberry Enterprise server, but they had no Blackberries anymore. So naturally, people made a lot of money by making mobile device management. But mobile device management was really just there to. Uh, do provisioning so basically everybody didn't have to come into the IT department and like have their their email and uh, like their VPN and everything set up for them like one by one they could just like basically download a profile and it would magically make it work but it really wasn't doing much for security um, so naturally there was a, a fit for that because people wanted security for mobility so they basically added on some more stuff and called it enterprise mobility management. This is probably what your enterprise has now, you know, some subset of an enterprise mobility management suite. You know, everybody and their mom has one that they're selling you. Even BlackBerry, oddly enough, bought one. So BlackBerry has come back as an enterprise mobility management vendor, which I think is hilarious because, um, you know, they were BlackBerry for a while. Um, but this is probably what you have. Again, it, it's really a lot of provisioning and a little bit of security. It's a different talk altogether, like bypassing this stuff in the worst way possible. Um, really, you have to take into account that any preventative technology, the bad guys are going to either buy it or pirate it um, and find ways around it before they send their attacks. This is true of, of things in the traditional computing world, certainly, you know, any of your your uh, you know uh, next generation firewalls, data loss preventions, um, you know on on device things, antivirus, all of it. They're all going to be getting past it. They're doing the same things here. You know that's not really the point. But again, uh, you know, in order for this stuff to get set up, in order for like the apps to get on there, in order for it to like set up the VPN, you know, they set up always on VPNs for you for your work. In order for it to do that, it might do its own SSL certificate, um, you know, anything that it's, it's doing in order for it to get around that, you know, security we talked about where it was just making the mobile antivirus be useless, you know, naturally the devices realizes they need to help with this, so they basically set up APIs um, for management applications to be able to do more, to dig deeper into the operating system 
And that's exactly you know, how these things are set up. You know, the users install configuration profiles to uh, make this stuff work. So, so you know, it's always nice when our attacks our users are taught to like do the things that we want them to, we want to social engineer them into doing as part of how to do their security posture. That is always helpful. When it's something they do over and over again to make themselves more secure and to be able to get their work email, let's be honest, then it really helps with our social engineering attack. Um, you know, mobile application management is generally a part of um, the mobile, um, uh, or the enterprise mobility management. Some people will just have this, you know, this is whitelisting and blacklisting applications that you're allowed to have at work. Like you may not be able to have Angry Birds. Um, it may also, like you'll see you have like two versions of email. One's your personal and one's your work email. So it'll like sandbox them off separately. So at least theoretically your work apps are secure. Again, it's a different talk getting around all this stuff, but you know, there's, where there's a will of a hacker, there is a way to get around all of these things. But again, um, in order to put these apps on there, if they're like specific corporate apps or they've been put in a special wrapper, like it'll take like a normal app and put it in like a security wrapper. But in order for that to work, like if you know anything about iOS, you know it has to be signed by Apple. Um, so if we're just like repackaging other apps, you know, that's gonna like break all of that and our mobile application management will just mean no apps on the phone basically. Um, so the way around this naturally, you know, Apple had to play ball here um, and made it so that, you know, you could get your own like in-house enterprise developer certificate. So it is signed by Apple, but it doesn't go through the Apple store like oversight where, you know, they check to see that you're not like doing a bunch of malicious stuff or you know, not using HTTPS or, or otherwise just being you know, an awful application, which again, that's not perfect either. There have been instances of bad apps getting in the app store, um, but generally speaking, having that oversight is good. And by having you know, your own you know, enterprise signing certificate, you are able to get around that. You can build whatever you want. And you know, if the user says yes, they can install it. This is what, again, like mobile application management does. This is what also what jailbreaking apps do. do. If you've ever been to like Z jailbreak or any of the other jailbreaking apps, you know, they're obviously not approved by Apple, let's be honest, but they have their own uh, developer certificates, which shows you how easy it is to get these things. Like it's in the, I have a white paper on this. Like you'd think the fact that I was a security company specifically going after mobility they would have thought twice about giving me one of these certificates, but uh, they even give them to the jailbreakers. So, you know, you have to like have a DUNS number and stuff, which I don't even know what that means, um, business stuff, um, but it's really easy to get one. And again, you know, users are used to doing it because not just are they using it to jailbreak their devices, but this is also like how their, their work apps are getting put on there. So again, the social engineering is good. Um, same thing with endpoint protection. You know, we've kind of gone full circle. Like the best thing that we're able to do now is basically mobile antivirus again, but it's mobile antivirus and then some. You know, the Gartner people call it mobile threat defense. Um, so it's you know that on-device application that, oddly enough, is you have to install a profile because it comes in through enterprise mobility management. Um, so again, users are saying, yes, I want to install this application that didn't come from the Apple App Store, it came from my corporate app store, which means I have to say yes to a profile. So the whole time we've been teaching users to do security around iOS, we have to say yes to all these profile things. So they've been taught to do it, which again is great for social engineering. So. There is a tool that is, is free in Apple that sets all this up. You, know, you can read all the documentation about how you have to like do all the XML and whatnot um, to like automate all this stuff. But it's really nice when, when Apple's just got this you know, graphical tool where I can literally just click and say what I want my, my profile to say and do. Uh, it's called Apple Configurator 2. You do have to have an Apple device to use it, unfortunately. Um, but nowadays they've got stuff like Mac and Cloud and whatnot. So you know, if you don't want to like splurge for the MacBook, there are ways around it. Um, but again, this is free. You just grab it, and uh, you've got 
all this stuff you can do, and this will set up the profiles for you, um, so you don't have to learn any fancy coding. Um, so, you know, you set up your profile um, and make it say what you want to say. I mean, there's a lot of things that are really funny about it. Um, like, you can sign profiles, but you also don't have to sign them. They can be unsigned, and all it does is warn the user it's unsigned, which just like, you know, any other unsigned thing, has that ever stopped anybody if they wanted what was on the other side? Absolutely not. Um, so uh, there's also things like, uh, in terms of once they say yes, because yes, they do have to say yes, um, that they want to install the profile, um, but you can set it um, that once they've said yes, they can't ever take it off. Like literally, they have to wipe their phone out to get rid of it, or they have to have a password to get rid of it, um, which if you don't tell them what the password is, is, is functionally the same thing. So, you know, as soon as they say yes once, they literally might have to wipe their device in order to get rid of you, um, which, is, which is nice. Which I get that they built this stuff for, like, to make it possible for security apps to work. But, you know, it's also totally possible to abuse this in the worst way, you know, with just like basic social engineering. Um, I, again, there is a white paper about this that, like, that I have out that goes into like all the different things you can do. We'll talk about a couple examples of them that are kind of funny and a couple of them that are kind of scary. Um, and you can have it like have a message so that'll like help you with your social engineering, like, you know, this is just a basic one. Install this profile to access enterprise email. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to trick anybody in a particular way, you can put it there. Um, again, it does say if you don't sign it, which you can sign it, um, it's not particularly hard. Um, it, it'll just say the profile is not signed, but it'll still let you install it, of course. Um, and again, I mentioned you can uh, put passwords on it or make it possible impossible for them to take it off at all, which again, you know, you social engineer them once and they're like stuck with it. That's always nice. That's definitely not music coming from me, right? Okay. Um, so a couple examples of things you can do. Um, you can, you know, like install a certificate. I mean, this is just the one from Burp Suite, so it's not that scary. Um, but you know, you see anything with like malicious root CAs and things like that, um, having, you know, a an additional certificate being trusted by an iOS device, you know, that may potentially allow people to get access to all of your traffic if they're able to man in the middle you. So certainly tricking someone into installing your malicious certificate authority is, you know, kind of nice. It even says on there this certificate is not trusted, but that's because it's port swigger. You can get around that. And you know, it warns you and it says, this will add it to a trusted certificate. Let's be honest, if we're not security people, we don't even know what that means. And again, we're used to saying yes anyway, because we do this for work. And, and this is probably, you know, the best social engineering attack for this is making it look like it's an update of your work one. Um, so, and this one I find really funny, passcode. So you cannot actually set somebody's passcode for them. Luckily, I mean, that would just be a disaster because um, then you'd lock them out of your their phone. But what you can do is um, like uh, set the minimum passcode length to like 16, minimum number of complex characters to four, maximum passcode age to like two days. So they have to reset it like every two days. Um, maximum auto lock one minute. So every minute that it's idle, it, you, they have to re -put, put it in. Passcode history, you can set it down so they like can't use old passwords. This is all really good stuff, right? If we're setting password policies, these are great. But really, you're just trying to mess with people in this case. Uh, maximum grace period for device lock immediately. Maximum number of failed attempts, you can set it down to like two. So basically, you've pretty much dosed or denial of service to their device there. So if you really just want to like mess with one of your friends, <laughs> this is a fun one. I mean, from a like actually taking over their device perspective, it's, it's not cool or anything, but it's funny. I thought it was funny anyway. Um, you know, certainly we can, uh, like they do for work, put a VPN on there. You know, that's a, a good way to do our security is VPN all the devices into work. So, you know, we, we have a secure connection, but, you know, the same way we could send them to say my VPN. So all their traffic is going through, you know, my VPN tunnel. And again, they're probably used to saying yes to this because they did it when they set up their work VPN the first time. 
We're literally doing the same thing. We're just asking them to install ours instead of works. Um, the where it gets, I think, really scary is uh, putting applications on there. And again, this is how you know not only jailbreaking applications, but also any of your mobile application management, any of your corporate apps, anything like that, are put on the devices. They have their their enterprise developer certificate. Again, it's not particularly hard to get one. You just basically have to do a couple phone calls with Apple and give them like your stuff about your business and whatnot, and then you get them. Like I said, if the jailbreakers and the security researchers can get them, it's not particularly hard. Um, so it's the same thing here. If you want to install an application that did not go through the Apple App Store, um, you have to put a, a developer certificate on it. Um, but again, the user is just prompted to say yes. They've probably, again, done it before for their mobile application management. So uh, if you're social engineer them into thinking it's part of that, then they're probably likely to say yes. Um, again, uh, so yeah, you can just, uh, this, just in your Xcode when you're building this stuff, just put your own uh, developer profile on there, like host it somewhere and then you know, social engineer people into downloading it. It prompts them to accept the certificate. Again, like they're always asked at, at their work anyway. And uh, then, you know, they run your application. Again, it didn't go through the App Store. And certainly it's not as bad as Android in terms of like, once you have an app on there, you don't even have to like exploit it because uh, all of the uh, permissions that applications can ask for are like really scary. They can get everything about the device. It's not quite as bad on the Apple side. They don't really just let you completely run amok. Um, but there are a lot of permissions you can ask for on the Apple side that you know, they'd probably be likely to stop you if you went through the App Store. But since you're not going through the App Store, you, know, you can just use them to steal data. Um, so you may not even need to do you know, additional exploitation from that point once you've got an app on the device. Um, so yeah, these are just like pictures about how to do it. Again, there's a white paper if you want to do it. I mean, basically it's just, you know, you sign it with your, your development certificate instead of sending it through the app store and it sends it with it. Um, of course, there are ways to automate this, like, this is a free tool I made that will automate all of it. There is a pro version, but um, in order to do any like uh, security research type stuff, you don't need the pro version, you just need the free version. So you can do all this um, for in the free version. Um, so, you know, to avoid having to like set any of this up, like setting up the social engineering or setting up the profile, you can actually just click some buttons in, in my little tool. Um, but the main point being like, why I put this in here is, uh, so once you've got an application on their device, um, again, we sent it in um, with the profiles, um, so we avoided the app store, we social engineered them into installing our app, the same they, way they would anything through their mobile application management, and now we can just you know, use the, uh, the built-in APIs in the application um, to like steal stuff off the device, uh, like we can get a list of the applications, um, we can like download and upload files, um, mess with Bluetooth, get their text messages, get their call records, contacts, location, things like that. Um, so again, it's, while it's not as bad as Android, you can certainly do a lot of stuff um, just with the built-in APIs. Um, but if you do want to go a little bit further, um, certainly uh, as new versions of iOS come out, very quickly they become jailbroken um, because you know, people want to jailbreak their devices uh, and a lot of times um, the code even becomes public for the jailbreaks uh, like Google Project Zero is generally pretty good about putting proof of concept code out there um, so certainly you know the bad guys are using it but the good guys are using it as well for things like penetration testing um, to see you know whether your devices are vulnerable um, so you can um, once you have an application on the device do local privilege escalation exactly like how the jailbreaking apps work as I've installing instead of installing Cydia you know if I was a bad guy I would you know steal all your data if I was a penetration tester I would just pretend I was stealing all your data to help you like fix your problems um, but certainly like a lot of the like jailbreak detections actually which again this is kind of another talk um, will actually just like check for the Cydia 
App Store, which is what a jailbreak typically gives you. But if it's an actual attacker who's giving root access to your device to like steal your iOS keychain, for example, like there's the iOS keychain, stole it all, got root privileges. Um, they don't need a, a third party App Store. Um, they just want to get root access and like steal what they want to steal. So like you can't get the iOS keychain except like the, the entries that belong to your particular app. Um, by default, but if you're root, you can, you know, with some finagling, do pretty much anything. So, like, this is just an example of, you know, if I get root privileges through basically repurposing jailbreak code, um, then I'm able to do even more scary stuff. So, if there's not an API um, through, like, the, the Apple APIs to, like, steal the keychain, for instance, because that would be bad, um, once you got root access to it, I mean, it's really just a Linux system under there. So. Um, certainly, you can do things there. So, you know, the point being that certainly enterprise profiles are not going to go away. Um, we need them because otherwise we'd be stuck in mobile antivirus land where then, uh, you know, it scans itself and that's the extent to what it's able to know about the security of the device, which since we don't control the devices ourselves, we really needed more than that. So it was really nice of Apple to give us this ability to uh, you know, get people to configure things like VPN, add our SSL certs, put our own uh, applications on there, often security applications, uh, but things that are controlled by our mobile application management. I mean, I'm not saying that these things should go away, but I'm just pointing out that, I mean, they can be used by attackers, and, you know, that's, I feel like, really been overlooked. Like, nobody's doing any, you know, security testing on this. When people are doing their uh, security testing for, like, social engineering, you know, the, let's be honest, they're not even testing for text messages most of the time. And, you know, they're certainly not checking to see whether someone would install a malicious profile or install a malicious application that would then, you know, give up access to the iOS keychain or, you know, any other secret data. Because, like, you know, some of the mobile application managements actually store, like, their, you know, management passwords in plain text in the iOS keychain, just saying. Um, but, you know, I'm a penetration tester, so, I mean, I'm not telling you all of this um, so you can go out and, like, attack people's phones and things. Um, you know, the point being that if you are part of, you know, a security program or in any way have any, like, access to being able to change policy at all, like, run screaming and say that, you know, one, we need to include mobility in our security programs, a lot of times it's just ignored, you know, as a penetration tester, you know, I pen test people's apps, but, you know, hardly ever does anybody want to bring, bring your own device or IoT or any of that stuff um, into the security testing, um, and, and they really need to because bad guys don't um, stop doing things that are bad just because it's out of scope, that, you know, they don't believe in scope. And this is particularly problematic because it's changing so rapidly. I mean, you think about, um, you know, my original, like, blue box uh, network diagram, and, you know, your topology of your network wasn't going to change that much. Yeah, a machine might die and it might get replaced, um, but, you know, with the mobile devices and the IoT and, and cloud services and things like that, they're changing so incredibly rapidly. Like somebody drops their phone in the toilet over the weekend and you've got a whole new device with a whole new security posture that came on just over the weekend. And, you know, multiply that by how many employees you have and, you know, you have a real problem here. So, one, the mobile devices really, really need to be in your security program. They need to be monitored. They need to be scanned. They need to be penetration tested. They absolutely need to be part of your social engineering. Uh, they, you know, you need to be doing more than just like don't click on links and emails. You need to be sending text messages, putting up rogue QR codes, you know, any of these, sending things over WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger. And you need to be, you know, sending more than, oh, that link got clicked. You need to be like simulating things like this because it can be really scary. You have something like this, you know, in your enterprise and there's nothing checking for it. It looks normal to the user because they did it 12 other times for, you know, their mobile application management and, you know, they just so happened to install something that came from bad guy X and, you know, if you haven't tested against it, there's nothing to monitor for it. Um, so, you know, you're out of luck and we need to do a lot better because this is a huge, huge vulnerability. Though it's also kind of fun because it's like, 
oh, let's just use, you know, the stuff they built for security purposes to, you know, mess with the devices. Um, so, you know, that's, that's my little talk. Um, it was rejected by Black Hat, so maybe it wasn't that great after all. But, uh, you know, thank you guys for your time. I've really enjoyed it here in Nepal. Like I said, I have business cards, but I do have to run to the airport because somehow I have to be in Egypt by tomorrow to give a talk and get my sixth continent. So thank you guys for your time. I really appreciate it. Here's some cards if you'd like. I'll just leave them up here. I really got to run.